very dramatic ending to that. Good morning again. Welcome to Life Point Crossing. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Ross, and uh, we are talking, and I hope thinking a, a little bit deeply and thoughtfully, and I hope helpfully, and certainly biblically through some of the major fundamental questions of really just human existence. Uh, who am I? Why am I here? Things of this nature. And specifically things like identity, we hear a lot about over the last couple of years. But most of the time, it seems to me that the really fundamental issues are generally skipped over just to get on with the name calling and the histrionics. Come on. And so really, though, some very, very valid and deep questions are brought up, but I, I feel like just never really thought through hope, in a, a helpful way. And so uh, we're here to, to try and help. And good news is the Bible has some tremendously helpful starting points on a lot of these things. And so if you were here or if you weren't, we started week one just at the beginning. We said, here's, here's what we are, is you are a creature that is created by a creator, and as simple as that is, that's really very, very helpful. That means that you know a creation can't define itself, so we don't have to try and look deep within us and somehow try to find or figure out whatever. No, we, we can find answers where there actually are answers, which is, it's, of course, the creator who defines the creation. And so we know to go to our creator God. And then last week, if you were here or if you weren't, we went one step further and we talked about how humans are uniquely and distinctly set apart from the rest of creation in that we are created in the image of our creator God. Really what we are is you are a spiritual creature created in the image of the Creator God, currently with a physical human body. This is distinct and different from the whole rest of creation. My dog doesn't ask, who am I or why am I here? Any of these things. And so this is as simple as it is. It's really helpful. It helps us to understand ourselves. It helps us a little bit to understand God. And we're sort of pulling ourselves up this wall of these questions with these handholds that Scripture gives us as we continue this journey on who am I and why am I here. And this does not have the same importance in my life that it did for, say, 10 years ago, although it, it's still there. But for a majority of my life, I've been a very big music fan and something even of a CD collector in my own little corner of the world. Now, I've never been able to acquire everything that I would have wanted or had interest in. This started way back when I was in high school, when I was poor and broke and didn't have any money. And then I grow up and r almost right out of college, I get married. And so now, like, how much money do I want to spend on something that's just my own hobby for my own personal enjoyment? Laura doesn't care at all. So you, you want to keep something of a cap on that. And so there was always more that I was interested in than I was able to have. But this did start in like 1990, like freshman in high school. And so over the years, I ended up with a, a fairly decent collection and with any number of items that sort of became very very, very rare and highly collectible, original copies of particular things. And so for a lot of years, I would go and you'd see these being sold on eBay for, you know, whatever, $30, $50, sometimes over $100. But I was never really tempted to sell for basically two reasons. Number one, they were awesome. And number two, they were very nearly irreplaceable. Some of these things where maybe somewhere between 50 and 300 were ever pressed in the first place, obviously never sold in stores. If you let go of your copy, then the only thing you can do is just watch eBay for hopefully a next one will pop up, and then who knows how high it's going to get bid up. So anything like that, I would just hold on to. Well then, over a period of time, a good number of these started to see reissues and re-releases and re-licensed. And now I was faced with a choice. Because here's one option that I had was to hold on to these very, very cool, still, although the music was released, the original copy is still very highly collectible in this particular little corner of the world. But then I would be able to continue to purchase new music in still just very, very limited quantities. Or 
I had the option of I could sell or trade some of these off, and with the small windfall that would come, I would be able to reacquire that music with the reissue, right? Often even with bonus tracks or remastering for better sound or something, and then add some other titles that I would be interested in. Well, what do you do? And I think this is a very interesting sort of test um, situation because I had the chance to really kind of sit down and think through this, and both had some real pull for me, but who, who am I really? Am I a collector? Who would never part with some of these collector items that might never be able to be replaced? Or am I more of a fan listener who probably would take advantage of the opportunity to trade some things off, to, to reacquire that music? I wouldn't be actually sacrificing any music to listen to and then would, in fact, be able to add some more titles. And once I knew who I was, once I answered that question, well, then I would know what to do. For what it's worth, I decided I was more of a listener fan and I'd, I did let go of some things to reacquire that music and more. But, but it's not what you do that determines who you are, but... Who you are does drive and determine what you do. And so that's a little bit of what we're going to be building toward today is who am I really at the core? What is the, the piece of me that drives or determines the other pieces? What is it that's really at the core of what makes up who I am? It's a very interesting question and it's something that really kind of has to be worked through and thought through fairly thoughtfully and very fairly carefully. I really do think it's interesting how strongly we tend to identify ourselves by our relationships. I think it's, it's very obvious to me that we are created to be relational creatures. You see this in a thousand different ways. On people's social media, they have like the five words that define them, right, or describe them, and then they'll be like, uh, mommy, wifey, daughter, and then like dreamer and coffee addict. But, okay, you've seen those too. But the first of those, you see, like intensely relational. Many of us find a huge portion of our identity in our relationships. And it, it sometimes often happens, I guess it's sometimes often, it often happens that that's more or most common or most obvious with women where often men tend to lean a little bit more into what they do as who they are. But I'll tell you that it's almost impossible for me to think of myself as anything other than husband to Laura. We've been together, we've been married for over 24 years. They happen to be the most recent 24 years, so they're very fresh in my mind. And I suppose I can remember what it was like to not be husband to Laura, but that seems so long ago and so far away. That that's become certainly a huge part of who I would say I am and, and a huge part of my identity. I don't know if this ever completely goes away, but especially when we're children, it's very difficult to think of ourselves apart from our parents, right? And so for today, I'll just say this right out, this is going to be slanted really fairly heavily toward those of us who would identify as Christians. You have called on God for forgiveness and salvation. You've had the sacrifice of Jesus stand in your place to satisfy God's justice for your sins. Listen, if you're here and that's not you, I'm so glad you're here. And really, I think this is a tremendously huge part of who God has created you to be, and this can be you today. Nothing would give me greater joy than if this was you by the time we walked out of here in a few minutes. But this is going to apply to those to whom it applies. And so here's, I think, the next logical handhold as we scale this wall of, of asking these questions is here's who we are, is you are a spiritual creature created in the image of that creator God and an adopted child of God. Our relationships really are a huge part of what defines us. We talked week one actually about how it's our, our names is sort of the first thing we might often use to identify ourselves. And it is very interesting to me that it seems as though God, our creator God, will be giving each one of us a new name. But then sort of the next tier down was these two of our relationships 
and what we do. And I don't think we should be surprised that relationships are very important and very core to who we are because, again, this really is just another reflection of the, the image of God that we're created in. God is an intensely relational being. He's existed since before the beginning of time in relationship with himself, one God in three persons, Father, Son, Spirit. And so we shouldn't be surprised that we are also highly relational creatures and that we find a major part of who we are in our relationships with one another and even more than that, with God. And so there certainly is a sense in which every human being is a child of God in terms of they are one of his creation, right? Which I, I know I'm kind of beating that to death, but there is also a special and unique way in which those of us who have come to follow Jesus are uniquely adopted as children in the family of God. John's talking, of course, about Jesus in John chapter 1. Here's what he says. He says, But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to look, become children of God. He says they are reborn, right? not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan. That's just regular born. But they are reborn with a birth that comes from God. There's a unique sense in which those of us as followers of Jesus are spiritually reborn and thereby adopted as children into the family of God. If that, if, that, if that spiritual rebirth and becoming children of God sounds actually a little bit like adoption, well, it didn't use the word, well, stay tuned. Here's from Romans. It says, so you've, you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we cry out, Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And the wording there, Abba, Father, indicates really a very, very intimate relationship, which might not be surprising to some of us. If you've grown up your whole life in a good church and studied scripture for a lot of years, then maybe that's very normal to you. In fact, I hope it is. But that was staggering. At the time that the New Testament was being written, they would have never imagined there could ever be such thing as a close, intimate relationship with the all-holy, all-powerful creator of the universe, God. But here we are, adopted as his children. This is a monumental change in relationship status. Here's another piece from Galatians. He says, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, which that's just a part of explaining how the relationship, again, has changed from the Old Testament sacrificial system here that he calls the law to now things are completely different, completely new, and so much better with Jesus. And so he says, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. Why? So that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, here it is again, Abba, Father. And now you are no longer a slave, right? You remember the last verse, we were slaves to sin. You're no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Now, I know concepts like fatherhood and adoption strike a lot of us very differently, and a lot of people have a lot of different sort of emotional or historical baggage that comes with some of those concepts. For sure, I had what I would consider to be a very, very good father, and so that's a very, very positive association for me, which is, I think, obviously what it is intended to be. Laura and I also happen to have had a very, very positive experience with adoption, so those are all very positive to me and to us. Certainly, I know if you you had something of an absent father or maybe one who just kind of seemed like it was more negative than positive, then that strikes very different emotionally. Or if you maybe happened to be adopted into a situation that was not good or not healthy or not what you or anybody would have chosen, then th that strikes very differently. But this is a monumental thing. Humans cannot exist in a vacuum. It is literally impossible for human beings to exist without relationship. I suppose 
In 2024, it's possible to have a test tube baby, but that still requires a human mother and a human father. And I think these are really far more core to our identity than we tend to recognize in what just happens to be a very individualistic culture in which we live. Where do each one of you get your last name? It comes from your father. In the time of the New Testament, it was very common for people to be known as name, son or daughter of Father, Jesus, son of Joseph, although that was not technically biologically accurate. It's all over. It's it's everybody. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon, son of Jonah. Uh, Still in our world, a ton of our names are Johnson, Jackson, Wilson, Larson. There's a huge part of our identity that we find in our parents, especially as children. And so as children of God, our relationship with him is a defining factor. So who am I? Well, my name's Ross, or whatever, it's complicated and dumb, but I'm what we call a Caucasian, heterosexual, male, son of Jim and Faith, teasing, husband, father, pastor, dog owner, Celtics fan, music listener, occasional CD collector, but not as much as listener, and whatever else I might be, all of that is secondary to and flows from, here's what I am. I'm a child of God. Everything else is a distant, infinitely distant second or derivative of this. Whatever else I might be is built on this foundation and seen through this lens. What is my name? It's if we talked about week one, if if God gives me a white stone with a new name on it, I don't even know what that is yet, but that's what I am. All of my relationships, right? Parents, wife, child, all, all of you. What, what, how, the way I conduct my relationships, this is subject to the authority, in, informed by and subject to the authority of God's o- authority and ownership in my life. My sexuality is informed by and subject to the authority and ownership of God owning who I am. I am a Celtics fan, but I still love Burt Michel even though he's a Lakers fan. Because I'm not a Celtics fan who comes to church and believes in Jesus. I cheer for the Celtics as a child of God. That is who I am. This is not all of the answers, but this is the answer that drives and determines all of the other answers. I was a music fan first, a CD collector second. And so once I knew who I was, I knew what to do. I'm a child of God. And this is what drives and determines everything else. This is really the answer. And that maybe really should be the entire message, or at least an entire message. But we're going to go actually another step and a step further today and talk, in fact, about the other thing where we tend to identify ourselves, which is by what we do. Because this is kind of related, and this is very, very important. Because, of course, what we do sometimes is a big part of who we are and makes up a large part of our identity. Tons of us introduce ourselves by our occupation. And if you do something 30 to 70 or whatever hours a week, of course, that's a very big part of your life. So I'm a pastor, you're a teacher or a nurse or a cook or a driver or a business owner or a retired something or other or, or whatever it is you are. Okay, but what you do does not define who you are. This is so important, particularly because this is, this is what tends to happen, right? If we define ourselves, for instance, as, well, I'm a sinner, So what do sinners do? Look, I I certainly hope and expect there are many, many days and many, many ways in which you choose what is right and not what is wrong. But I know it's true that we do all have plenty of sin. We all have plenty of wrong. But remember who defines you. And here is an incredible summary from Titus chapter 3. It says, once we too were foolish and disobedient, 
We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. This is not asking you to pretend that you have no history. This is not asking you to ignore any sort of real reality, and this absolutely is not going to suggest that somehow Jesus is for good people, right? Because all this, and you guys, it can be the greatest word that you ever see, or it can be the worst word that you ever see. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. We were just talking about reborn spiritually, right? And he generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior because of his grace. Who is it that defines who you are? It is your creator. What does he declare that you are? You guys, he declares you righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. How good is this? The most foundational piece of this entire series is that you are what your creator says that you are. Whatever he declares that you are, there is no appeals court, there is no higher authority. He is the authority. Everything that we are, we are whatever he says we are, we're whatever he made us to be. It all comes and flows from what he says we are. Here's what he says you are, is he declares you righteous. And it's, of course, not even very clearly, very obviously, not because of whatever you've done, right? It's Your righteousness comes to you from Jesus. It's actually his righteousness, which is, of course, how it can be real and true, even though, of course, we all know that we have sin. But through Jesus, God declares you righteous, and you are not what you do. But who you are does does determine what you do. If you're on a business trip and someone invites you to their hotel room and you say, well, I'm married, here's what that means is I'm exclusively committed to one individual, which is not you. I thereby declare that I, I decline your adulterous invitation. That part of who you are determines what you do. If Arthur Bryan offers you a rack of ribs and you say, I'm a vegan, here's what that means is I'm not going to eat the ribs because that part of who you are determines what you do. If somebody asks you who you're going to vote for in November and you say, well, I'm 13 years old, that means you're not going to be voting because that part of you determines what you do. Here's who you are. You are all good. And I just... You are a spiritual creature created in the image of God who has become a righteous, adopted child of God through Jesus Christ. Don't let this be a nice message that makes you feel good for a little bit. Let the truth transform you and how you see and think and act into being who and what God says you are. Because Satan takes the half-truth that you're a sinful human being and makes that into who you are. You're, You're just a sinner who happens to be following Jesus. Isn't that true? Well, of course there is a half truth to that. So you say, well, I, I guess that is what I am. I mean, nobody's perfect. And so here comes a situation where you kind of know what's righteous and what isn't. But you know what? I'm not really that righteous. Lie from hell. You are what God says you are. You are a righteous, adopted child of God. You're not a slave to sin. You are a righteous, adopted child of God. Your identity is no longer sinner. This is who you are. How does a righteous, adopted child of God handle that situation? The way in which you see yourself will be 
incredibly powerful in the way in which you conduct yourself. So will you see yourself the way that God sees you? Will you be who God says you are? You are not what you do, but who you are does determine what you do. So here's who we are. Every single one of us here today, we are all a spiritual creature created in the image of our creator God. And if you're here as a follower of Jesus, here is the core of who you are past there. Here is the foundation that everything else is built on. This is the fountainhead that everything else flows from, is you have become a adopted child in the family of God with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. How good is that? Someone just said amen. That was like the first time in two years here, and that was probably the right time for it. How good is that? You guys, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Uh, what, what do we say about this? How could we be your adopted children with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, despite everything that we know we've been a part of and are in, in our past and our history. Father, how can you be the most gracious Father that could ever possibly exist in the universe and we get to be the beneficiaries of that and look to you as our Abba Father? Oh, listen, still praying. If you're here and, and you're the person who would when you walked in, would not have identified as a follower of Jesus. You've never placed your faith in him to allow his righteousness and his righteous sacrifice to stand in your place to satisfy justice before God. This is your time. Your moment is right now. You can do this. God is waiting and eager for you to take on that righteousness of Jesus and take you in as his adopted child in his family. Just right where you sit. You can pray and, and say it out loud. You can just say it to him in your heart. He'll hear you. Pray, pray something like this. Say, God, I believe that Jesus Christ came and died and resurrected so that I could be forgiven and adopted as a child in your family. Oh, please come into my life. Forgive me and adopt me. Begin to make me into the person you created me to be and give me the life that you have for me. If you just prayed a prayer like that, just like we saw in, in these verses, you're not saved because of any righteous thing you do, including praying a prayer. It's through the grace of God that comes to you through your faith in Jesus. You are forgiven and a new spiritual creation adopted as a child in his family. Please don't try and do it by yourself. There's a whole family that is waiting to invite you in and welcome you in and help you into your new first steps. Let somebody know. You can go back and tell the person this at the point. That's just the corner in the lobby about your decision. When we're done here, they'll take your information. We'll be able to follow up with you and give you some good first steps toward your healthy new life. If you're watching online, send us a message, but let somebody know. Those of us who maybe we kind of knew this, maybe, maybe we've never really quite felt it, maybe we've just never quite lived in it. Listen, right now, between yourself and the Spirit of God, will you commit to living as what He says you are? Will you, between yourself and the Spirit of God, ask Him to transform who you are, the way you think, the way you see, the way you live, the way you act, into being who God says you are? That is the truth. That is the reality. That is the authority. Don't disagree with God. That's insane. Will you commit to living and being who and what he has created you and adopted you to be a righteous child of God? Father, we're so grateful for all that you are and all that you do for us. And all that we can do is offer back to you our entire lives in gratefulness, in love, in gratitude. Father, we love you and we are thrilled and delighted to be your children in the name of Jesus Christ.